Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vassalash, episode 330 for May 6th of 2016. Don Pano's Delta Wing and Le Mans. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for Autoline in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Mr. Vasilash. How are you, John? Another day, another show. Mm -hmm. Blue shirt day. And, uh... Everybody got the, the memo here, yeah, it yeah. looks like. Yeah. And uh, we should let everybody know, Todd Lassa from Automobile Magazine is with us again. Hello, John. Good to be back. It's great to have you here, Todd. And, uh, and of course, we got to let everybody know our special guest for today is Don Panos, the, the chairman, the CEO of Delta Wing Technologies. And, Don, it's awesome to have you here. I've been wanting to get you on the show for several years, so the fact that you're here today, to me, is just brilliant. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to meet your friends. <laughs> Right. So I'm, I'm sure uh, I, like much of the rest of the audience, needs to learn more of what Delta Wing Technology Group is all about. But uh, let's just start out with your race car. And what we have to let everybody know is we're actually shooting this show before the Long Beach Grand Prix race, right. where your car is going to be running. Uh, you did terrific at the opening of the 24 Hours of Daytona. Uh, yeah, you had some issues at Sebring, so I'm, I'm hoping when this show airs, everybody will already know the results, but you're making progress with your car. Yeah, the car, the car for all intents and purposes, is perfect. Yeah, I mean, everything we've done. We had problems in the beginning, really, with the architecture of this car and the technology of the improvements with the gearbox for about 13, 14 months to, to figure out how to solve those problems. And we've sorted those out. Uh, at Daytona, we were, you know, we could run as fast as anybody. You were in the lead. You led yeah, for, we what, a couple lead. of hours yeah, or something? And all of our drivers always set the fastest time in, in the car. Uh, the problem was there was a minute and 17 seconds with the car parked in the middle of the track with no lights in the dark, and they didn't throw a caution flag. And, and your car hit, crashed into hit, it. Yeah. Right. Uh, Sebring was good. We, we went to within 17 minutes of the end. Uh, but uh, it had rained at Sebring. There was uh, Big rain a three-hour red flag. And uh, uh, we had a, a problem with our ECU uh, from some water. And we brought it in and we changed it out. And that is connected, uh, part of that's connected to the steering column. And somewhere... Uh, in the race, uh, it kept, you know, jiggling, and uh, 17 minutes from the end, the steering column broke. So. <laughs> I hate when that happens. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so and we, Don, were on, we were on the lead lap, but uh -huh. at the time. For, for the viewers that are not familiar with Delta Wing, explain to us how you guys came up with what is arguably one of the most revolutionary designs in the auto industry for quite some time. Yeah. I wouldn't even say arguably. It is one of the most All right. revolutionary yeah. designs. Right. Well, I, ac I accept that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, among them, I mean, you know, for sure. Now, I don't think you need uh, to qualify it. I, I'd like to take a lot of credit for that, but uh, in reality, it was really came out of Chip Ganassi. And uh, Chip Ganassi had this idea for this car uh, to go to Indianapolis and to be an Indianapolis car. Uh, somewhere along the line, in the wisdom of all the great engineers and designers out there who have never seen anything like this, they all said it wouldn't work, it would fly, it wouldn't corner, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it, it didn't happen. It didn't become an Indy car, spec car. Uh, a little later on, uh, we got involved into the American Le Mans series and approached the ACO in France, the organizers of Le Mans, uh, to get it into Garage 56. Which is for special, one-off kind of yeah, race technology cars. Technology cars. And you can't get points, and you're racing in the race, but you're just showing technology. And, uh, in fact, we got an invitation for it to go there in 2012. 
and the car ran for six and a half hours perfectly, ran uh, competitively, although they did give us the time brackets that we had to stay within because they didn't want us uh, pushing with people that had a chance to win the Le Mans. So we stayed within those time frames. We did show in practice nights before the weekend that we could run six or seven seconds a lap faster, but we stayed within those constraints. We were staying competitive, and then we were hit by the Toyota, if you remember the pictures of Le Mans, and knocked into Watched the wall. Watched it live. Walked, knocked into the wall. And you know at Le Mans, once you go off, uh, that's it. You're, you're not getting back in the race. He, although that driver tried to push it, corolla, uh, uh, caress it, uh, talk to it, kick it, and uh, he couldn't get it going, so that was it. So why did people think the car was going to fly? I mean, because of the... So, Narrow front end. Very narrow front end, and yeah, then it goes back and... Right. I heard other people say ahead of time, there's no way that thing, that thing can turn. Yeah. I mean, you know, turn at speed. Yeah. Well, it's... The, the whole concept of the Delta Wing is 50-50-50. 50% of the weight, 50% of the horsepower, and 50% uh, of the fuel. And in, in other words, it's such a light car, such an aerodynamic car, you can put in a much smaller engine and it burns half the fuel exactly. of a other race car of comparable performance. That's right. It, it, we're running, at Sebring and Daytona, we're running about 350 horsepower, and the prototypes are running 650. And you were running competitive laps against them. Yeah, and half the fuel. We're on a 10-gallon <laughs> fuel tank, and we were getting about a lap more. And how much of a weight advantage do you have versus those other cars? Can you talk about the... That car is about 540 kilos. Oh. And they're, they're a 1,000, over 1,000. Mm -hmm. So it's 50-50-50. Yeah. And uh, the reason why it works is uh, it's a fulcrum. Uh, the design of this car, uh, if you look at the front, it's narrow. The front tires only have four inches of tread on each tire. Only... Four inches of I've trip. seen bicycles with bigger tires. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, it comes back, and 70%, over 70% of the weight is in the rear between the axles, okay? And it's like a fulcrum. If you get all that weight holding everything down, how do you out here pick it up? You know, get a fulcrum to go move a boulder, and you have a stick this big, you can't move it, but get a big long stick, you can move it. So... In the architecture, it is about a fulcrum, and it is about the balance of weight. And I, I had heard, too, that one of the ways that it does corner is that you're actually applying the brakes on the inside wheel. Is that right? On the rear inside. No, the, brake, the brakes are normal. No, no, no. But, I mean, for helping the car turn, not only do the front wheels turn, but you're using, you're braking the inside back rear wheel to help it rotate? Well, we're break, breaking the rear wheels, but not one over the other. Oh, okay. Okay, so the turning comes strictly from the front yeah, tires. And the, and the drivers will tell you with this car that when you go into a corner, you, you don't have this sensation what breaking. You you ha they have this sensation. Hmm. So they're not being thrown forward. They yeah. feel like they're going they're backwards. Stepping back, right. Whew. So what, what did you think the first time you saw the design of the car? I mean, you, 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 you're familiar with, with, I mean, your company has produced... All so, kinds of race cars and, 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 production, and, and cars. production cars, street cars, nice sports car looking things. And here's this this unusual looking object. And when you saw it, what did you think the first time? Same as you. This is crazy. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I thought it was crazy. And then they they came up. They came to Petit Le Mans that year, and uh, uh, that was that was 2010 because it was it was. Uh, given the invitation in 2011. So they came to Petit Le Mans. They had been just rejected by Indy. And they started to tell me a little bit about it. And Scott Atherton, who was head of our ALMS series then, uh, talked to it. We, the ACO people, were at Petit Le Mans. And we put together a meeting, and they explained the, the, the performance of the car. And uh, we... Talked about it for a while, and then in January, I wrote some letters to the ACO and people and said, look, you know, we, the car is, was, was then being built out of Gurney's place, and uh, we had some uh, testing to do to show that it would corner and uh, it wouldn't fly. And uh, they sent an invitation for Garage 56, and 
uh, for us to be presented at Garage 56 that year and then to race the following year in 212. And uh, how, long, how long after uh, Ganassi got the ball rolling on this car did you become involved? Uh, okay, you got to bear with me for a minute. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a young chicken anymore, but uh, my memory is pretty good. Like I said, this was 2010 that we talked to the ACO. I didn't get involved until the following October in 2011. So it was, it was shown at the Chicago Auto Show for the first time yeah. in 2010. Yeah. And, and during this period now, when you, when you mentioned the Petit Le Mans, for those who don't know, that was a series that you owned, correct? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's a race that we owned in the American Le Mans series, okay. which we owned. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when they met the French and, and, uh, and talked about uh, coming to Garage 56. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't actually get involved in it till November of 2011. Uh, they, had, they had been awarded Garage 56. They're going to be in the process of building the car. Uh, there were other people involved, and they weren't getting anywhere. They, didn't, uh, they hadn't raised any funding. Uh, they'd raised some funding, but it had been spent, and that needed to go forward. So. We stepped in, reorganized the company, and uh, started uh, participating in it in November of 2011. What made you think that it would be successful? Uh, well, first of all, I, I don't like to do things everybody else is doing. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't mean I don't have the, the normal instinct of everybody else when you see something quite outrageous that you doubt it. But uh, the more I got to look at it and the more I got to think about it, uh, and I wanted to see it be successful even as a bystander. Uh, I think that when it came to realize that this had either a chance to go or a chance to die, I decided it should go. And That's it fantastic. should be given a fair test. Now, Nissan got involved at one point, and I know you've told me you can't talk about that right now. I guess there were some lawsuits involved, is that right? Uh, we are making no comments on... Okay. The, the case between our suit against Ms. Okay, Clark. so we won't bring that up anymore, but I just wanted to let the audience know, you know it's, it's not that we're ignorant of this, but you, you've warned us you, you can't talk about that aspect yeah. of it. But it is our Delta Wing. It, it, it is your Delta Wing. Exactly. Plus, you've got a street car or a road version of this coming. Yeah, we've come now to develop the road car. And, and you're calling that the Delta Wing GT. Uh, Carmen, can we bring that picture up? We've got some photos of this thing. That's it. So tell us about this. So, well, when, where, why, how much, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is, again, doing something that's different. Uh, we've taken the uh, architecture of the Delta Wing and incorporated it into a vehicle that could be a road car. And the first one that we came up with was this design, which is a GT. But basic chassis and design could also be a 2 plus 2. Uh, the GT car, uh, we want it to be competitive. So it's uh, about 340 horsepower. And we'll talk about racing trim uh, compared to a Ferrari Porsche 550 horsepower. Uh, but you're saying because of the power to weight ratio, you're going to be competitive with and them. And the architectural advantage. The, the, the aerodynamics. Yes, yep. aerodynamics is a big thing. When uh, we, we got this finally designed, a lot of engineering, a lot of CFD analysis, and we wanted to be around 0.25, which we think is a really good number. Uh, we got the car designed. Uh, the, the, the function between the 2 plus 2 and the GT GT in a gasoline petrol engine is tall. It takes up a lot of room in the back. Uh, unfortunately, Pena's always was front engine, but in this case, this is a rear engine car. Uh, and with a 2 plus 2, because it only needs about 80 or 90 horsepower to be a nice family car and efficient, uh, the engine isn't sticking up, so we have plenty of room for two passengers in the back, up to about six foot tall. So the, the GT car is what uh, we're excited about in putting out for racing and uh, as a sports car. It'll cost about somewhere around $100,000. As the race car? As, as a road competitive oh, road? sports car. Okay. Uh, and uh, 
it's going to be, like I said, 340 horsepower compared to their 550. And the road version may be 320 compared to their 525 or 5 whatever. And uh, it'll get good gas mileage, and uh, it, will, uh, it will compete. John's viewers will want to know how soon they can buy one of those. Well, right now, uh, current status of the car is the chassis for the race car have been built because we want to race it. Uh, the, the buck is done. We're actually out doing the body molds as we talk. Hmm. And uh, we'll start putting, and the engine and drivetrain is all selected. Uh, can, can you tell us whose engine you're using? Uh, well, we're using, uh, we always use Elon engines, but Elon engines buys their engines from Ford or General Motors or whoever, but then we redo them. You, you breathe some life into them, Yeah, eh? we, we make them uh, a little lighter on their feet. Okay. So you have an extensive manufacturing facility down in Georgia, Brazelton, yeah. Georgia, is that correct? Yeah. And yeah. So you, you have autoclaves down there for body panels and oh, yeah. engine build and, and machining. Yeah. and cells, everything. So, so you can be a car manufacturer. Yeah, and we have. We make the Panos Esperantes, so mm -hmm. right. road cars. Uh, and we made uh, four Indy winners in a six-year period of time. We built the kart cars, the last kart cars. That, those were ours, built by us. Star Mazda cars, those were all built by us. So. And we do a lot of engine work for independent people, uh, not just our own engine requirements, but for other people. Mm -hmm. And if you look back over our racing Except for the first year at Le Mans, when I finally decided we needed to do our own engines and not have them done by uh, other well-known engine builders. Uh, uh, you look at our history at Le Mans, our engines were superb. And uh, when we won Le Mans in 2006, uh, that car not only set a record for the time distance traveled at Le Mans, but it went on to win the race the next weekend with the same engine, which is unheard of. That is. Yeah. Especially in that era, at that yeah. time frame. That's 2006. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you basically, uh, Elon engine starts with a Ford or a Chevy block and everything else. Yeah. Is, okay. Yeah. Well, all of our uh, uh, GTR1s and our Le Mans prototypes, th that was all the small block, mm -hmm. Ford small block, mm -hmm. normally aspirated uh, uh, Engine. Can you Lim say what you're Lim starting with uh, for the for the new road car? Excuse me. Can you tell me whether you're starting with the Chevy or the Ford for the new road car? Uh, we are we are working because we have another car called the City Go, which is we'll, we'll talk about that in yeah, just a moment here. But, right. Uh, we're talking to both companies, and we have engines from both companies which are working on. Both of them are suitable for our gearbox, and that oh, gearbox okay. was uh, for the GT car. Really, was very important that. We've sorted out those issues, and we keep, we keep it. We keep using that. We don't need to go back through that development again. When you talk about the 50-50-50, this has got to be very compelling to companies like General Motors and Ford. When they look at what you guys are doing in terms of light weighting, downsizing the engine. Aero. Aero. I mean, have they talked to you and said, hey, you know, you guys have something here in, in this approach. We, we need to be with you on this. I... I uh I really can't discuss those kind of conversations ongoing now because uh, we are going to license or we're going to do different things, and I don't think it's prudent for me on behalf of our company to talk about which way we're going or who we're doing that with. But I can tell you in the beginning uh, a nice interesting story is, is that in 1998, one year after we entered racing, we built and raced the first hybrid, affectionately called Sparky, and it won Petit Le Mans in its GT R1 class. Uh, and I went to see, uh, I won't say the name, but I went to see the head of research at a famous OEM, and then I went to see another one at another famous OEM, and the answer I got was the same from both people. This is 98. We're not interested in hybrids. <laughs> So what is it? What is it about the the culture in companies like that, where they look at innovative things that you guys have that are obviously getting the job done, and yet they say that they're not interested? I think uh, I think it's it's part of, and, and I can understand this because I've built two pharmaceutical groups. I've had a series of resorts. I understand what happens in management. I understand what happens with people, 
you get, uh, in, and then extremely large companies, you get into a culture. And uh, the, culture, the culture has a fence around it, and there's not many gates to get in or out. And once you get in, you certainly a lot of times don't want to find the gate to get out. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think uh, it's like us dealing with what we want to deal with in the next step is the EV car. And the new ba the new batteries uh, and the new motor engine motor technology we have for the electric cars, uh, I think that when when you think about that, the OEMs think that an electric car, uh, and also their thinking has been prodded by DOT and the environmentalists and everybody and grants and. Uh, uh, carb credits, et cetera, et cetera. So th they they now think that's new technology. But what do they do? They take it and they put it in an old technology car because that's their fence. That's what they're used to. Uh, you know, Ferdinand Porsche did the first one in 1892. It's not new technology. <laughs> I mean, things that developed in electric technology uh, in our case, like the new motors we got out of DHX and Georgia Tech, uh, you know, uh, the ultimate is 320 horsepower at about 50 pounds in 8 by 8 inches. Wow. Uh, we think of a one horsepower motor, it's this big and 100, 100 pounds or 80 pounds, you know. So I think people will start to come along and they start to see this and the proof is in the pudding. They said this car would fly, the delta wing. They said it wouldn't corner. We've shown that's not the case. We've shown that with the aerodynamics and the design and the CFD that done by independent engineering companies that we can improve performance by 42%. And if we compare that to a Chevrolet Sonic right now, that's 76 miles on the highway. That's, that's about 47, uh, 47 in the city and about 56 miles combined. That meets the 2025 standards right today, hmm. right today. So uh, God bless them. Sometimes it takes them a while. You know, it's like the Titanic. The Titanic wasn't a speedboat. It couldn't turn on a dime. Smaller companies can. And, uh, you know, the Titanic, uh, if it could have turned quicker, it would have missed that iceberg. Yeah. But <laughs> unfortunately, it didn't. So, Don, let's go into uh, this electric car that you're working on. You call it the City Go, is yeah. that right? City Go. So, so fill in the details. What, what's this about? Well, the City Go is a, a three wheel car, it's uh, three passenger. We got a picture of it here. Uh, yeah, that's there. it there. Uh, also, kind of Delta Wing ish, very yeah. tear dropper well, or all, bullet shaped. That has all the architecture of the Delta Wing. What's important about it is it's got about 35% more storage space uh, than, say, a Prius. Wow. Okay. And, and this is uh, two-passenger? It can be three pa It's a three-passenger car. Okay. But this can be, uh, you can see You can now, see the seating arrangement. The seating arrangement. One in front, two in the rear. Yeah, and you see the storage area in the back. It's gigantic. And uh, this can be... Uh, this could be an ideal car for uh, an Uber driver. Hmm. It's green. Uh, or a Lyft driver. It could be an ideal delivery vehicle for small packages like the Amazon people are doing now. Uh, it can deliver pizzas as well as anything else. It could deliver... We had the Domino's pizza truck the in here yeah, uh, the, the other day, right? It could deliver pizzas. That can deliver groceries. And, but, and this will be pure electric. It can be electric. Uh, but we also will build a, a petrol version because there are places in the United States that uh, electric cars might not work too well. I mean, there are places with long distances and very cold temperatures. In the, in the wintertime, EVs don't work so well. But this, this is true. They, so they lose a lot need of an range. alternative for that. Mm -hmm. But we'll build both. And it's just the difference of the drivetrains in them. So... The, Okay, now, now, Carmen, bring up that picture of that electric motor. Tell us about this, because what's so interesting is here you've got an electric motor, you've got a soda can next yeah. to it for scale, and it's not much bigger than a soda can, and you told me this is what, 20 horsepower? Now that's 40 horsepower. 40 horsepower. That's 40 horsepower. That's a three-phase 40 horsepower electric motor, and that motor will weigh about 30 pounds. <laughs> and at the uh, SAE show downtown... Tomorrow, uh, you will see 
the the newest version done in aluminum because this was all done out of uh, steel, uh, and out of came out of Georgia Tech and DHX. That's where we they had the patents. that's where they developed the technology. And we got yeah. the license, mm -hmm. and uh, and then you're going to see uh, pretty soon the, the one for the sports car. Which will be 320 horsepower. It will be eight by eight inches, and it's a five-phase motor. Wow! And and that'll weigh more or less. That'll weigh 45 to 50 pounds. 45 to 50 pounds, 350 horsepower. Yeah. That's astonishing. Yeah, and so you know we were talking before about the technology things here, and we're talking about cumulative technology. So if you take the architecture, and you say, okay, we can get 40 percent better fuel economy. Better fuel economy. Okay, put that drivetrain in the car, you're going to get 40%. But look at the difference in the weight of the motor and the gearbox. And with that, you should have something more. Because you're going to save a couple of hundred pounds at least, yeah. right? so you should go further. Okay, let's just replace just the weight that's saved with the motor and the gearbox with more batteries. You'll go that much further again. And then we have a new thing that you'll see down there called BICEP, and that's as much as I'm going to say about it, except it connects all the batteries without having all the wires and the insulation and stuff. And so you're picking up weight and, sp and space. Yeah, weight, space, and, ma and excuse me, manufacturing assembly costs. Mm -hmm. You know, each guy hooking up one of those batteries, that's a lot of time. And we know in production companies and, and line manufacturing, that's an expensive item. Mm -hmm. So it'll be cheaper. Uh, it'll be lighter, and we figure we'll say 50 to 60 pounds in that in a, in a standard EV vehicle, and again, that will give you more range. Or replace that with batteries and get that much more range again. Okay, and the batteries, you got anything special up your sleeve on that? Well, we're, we're just working with a standard lithium ion. There are some, there is another battery that's coming out, which we've looked at, which is about 8% uh, lighter, which is helpful. Uh, the same amount of power. Uh, we are talking to several battery companies to ascertain if they can imagine what is the battery they want to launch two years from now. That's the one we want to be testing now. And wouldn't you like us to be doing this in the Le Mans GT car? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what is it, I mean, so how do you guys get the performance out of that small package? I mean, I, I saw something, direct winding heat exchanger technology. Yeah. I mean, yeah. w what is that? Well, one of the biggest problems with electric motors is heat. And when that motor you saw with the Coke can, when that motor's running, you can put your hand on it. Hmm. And it's an internal cooling process. Uh, uh, Rhett Mayer, who is uh, Professor Rhett Mayer, who was the inventor of this, is is here in town. He'll be at, at the show tomorrow. He can explain it better than I do, but he has an internal cooling system that, that cools at the core of where the heat is generated. Hmm. And uh, uh, it is exceptional. And when you can cool, and the more that you can cool, then as I understand it, that's the more power efficiency you get with your motor. Hmm. Did, you, did you go to him, University of Georgia, right? Uh, He's Georgia Tech. Uh, Georgia Tech, I'm sorry. Did you go to Georgia Tech and say, we're looking for this, or were they developing it, and did, did, who came to whom, I guess? Okay, well, uh, first of all, Georgia Tech's about 40 minutes from where we are sure. in Brazelton. Yep. Straight down I-85 and just fall off to the right before you get to downtown Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the area. Uh, we had... Uh, we have some people that uh, interact at Georgia Tech. We recruit designers, we recruit engineers, and we heard about this electric motor. And so uh, Ed Triolo and our company uh, went down and uh, they demonstrated it. And he came back and he said, Don, I couldn't believe this. I, that motor was running, I was watching all the RPMs and, and uh, whatever the electrical measurement is they use for determining power, and he says, I was putting my hand on it, and it wasn't even hot. And so I said, well, do you think you can get them up here next week? And they came, and <laughs> we sat down and did a deal. I, I visited you in your, your company in Brazelton, um, and this was part of a press trip. I was maybe yeah. another dozen or so auto journalists uh, 20 years ago this coming fall. And um, 
your one of your PR guys who you've probably long gotten rid of, maybe because of this reason, but <laughs> now I want to hear the told, story. <laughs> told us that at least at the time you're not much of a car guy. No, you're still not much of a car guy. I d just, I can honestly tell you, and people think I'm BSing here. I can honestly tell you, I have a new Jaguar four door, the big one. Yeah. I don't know how to open. I've never looked at how to open a hood. <laughs> and I've had it for seven months. Uh, I'm not much of a car guy. Let me, let me explain it. Uh, do I like the challenge? Yeah, I raced in the soapbox derby when I was a kid, mm -hmm. built cars. Uh, am I intrigued? And I hear all the chatter and the, and the talk about uh, this got so many valves and it's this horsepower and it's got this much torque. Now, I, I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested in the challenge of beating the guy over there. And <laughs> what is it that we can put together? You're the businessman behind it. Huh? And you're the business. You're the businessman. Well, but uh, the technology uh, fascinates you, right? The technology that I mean, these, and, these and little and engines and aerodynamics and things yeah. like that. I mean, well, like, like 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 waiting. I mean, in in uh, 2002, 2003. We were, we were the first to build all-aluminum chassis and lightweight all-aluminum cars. And our, our, test, our test score within the crash test, I think the standard then was 1,000. If you were above that, you failed. The industry was more or less between 700 and 500. And the Pano's Esperante was 150. It was in the top one percentile. And that was us using aluminum versus their steel. So... We like those, I like that kind of a challenge. But uh, as, I mean, am I out driving fast every day or doing? Well, but, but the other thing is that 20 years ago, you were, uh, the, the, re the reason for the press trip is that you were introducing, uh, and I think it might have even been the second generation of a, um, of a retro sports car that was designed in Ireland, and you bought the rights and were my starting son, to build. It was my son that did all that. Yeah. Your son did that. Yeah, the, and, the Roadster. Right, the Roadster, right. Uh, that's why I couldn't remember the name. It's yeah. called the Roadster. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, this is before Petit Le Mans. Obviously, a lot has come since then, and I wonder, you talk a little bit about how you've gone from the Roadster 20 years ago and... And your son being involved in that largely. Well, he, okay, he, well, hold on. Let, we got to take a quick commercial break here. It's going to be very brief. Hold that thought. Re ask sure. that question. Carmen, let's take a quick break right now because we got, we got to give some time to our sponsors. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back, and uh, I cut you off, both of you, but Todd sort of picked that thought up again. And Okay, well, so 20 years ago, your, your son was involved with the... Uh, yeah, he's he knows road. He started all he this. And he all started all this, right? <laughs> and and you describe yourself Here as Here's not a much of a car guy. A lot of fun to drive. And um, so, how did you get from there that that one car uh, to you know Petit Le Mans, and now you've got the uh, the the Delta Wing, which is spawning uh, a, a road car, an electric car. How do you go from there to here? And and you've been you've raced at Lamar, you had your own series yeah how, how did that build up w was that in your mind 20 years ago well i can tell you the truth when uh when we went to sebring in 1997 with the first pain i was gtr1 that was only the fifth race i'd ever been to in my life so you can't say that i was a car guy in 1996 i uh danny always had this thing about building cars. And uh, you said Ireland. He, uh, or somebody said Ireland. He, he, he went over to, because he, he grew up in Ireland uh, hmm. during my tenure of Elon Pharmaceuticals, the te technological company I formed. Mm -hmm. He grew up. He was educated there. He wanted to build cars. And he went back over. He went to Embry-Riddle. Then he helped me with uh, designing some equipment and stuff for the vineyards at Chateau Lawn. And went over to Ireland 
to want to go to work for a car company that was in Ireland. And uh, he went down for an interview on a Friday, and they told him that, you know, they weren't interested. And on the following Monday, they filed for bankruptcy, and he... I think he, I know who that was. He, <laughs> At least they were honest with him. He bought it, and, he, and that's where the roadster came from. Oh, okay. So, uh, and 96, uh, going forward, that was about 1989. Mm -hmm. Going forward to 96, I said to him, you know, you need to have a racing heritage. There's, these roasters are great, and people love them, and they're, you know, they're a handful, and they can, uh, they can, you know, perform. And he said, look, and, I, and that was, I was retiring in 97 from Elon Corporation. And he said, uh, you're retiring next, uh, in January, so uh, I'm busy doing the Esperante, which is the next car that came. And he said, uh, you do the racing. So I, I didn't know anything about racing. And I said, you know, Danny, you've been with me every time I've been to race. There's been four of them. And uh, he said, you'll do fine. He said, you'll <laughs> do fine. So he then introduced me to a chap, Adrian Reinhardt. Excuse me just a minute. Yeah, you guys keep on talking. I'm going to get everybody some water. Uh, I know Don wants one. Uh, he introduced me to a guy, Adrian Reinhardt. And he mm -hmm. said, uh, Adrian's coming over to look at the roadster. And... Uh, Adrian's a good English guy, and he came over and he said, uh, your son tells me you might be interested in racing. And he said, well, what kind of racing are you interested in? Well, I had just seen the Steve McQueen movie, so I said Le Mans. Le Mans, yeah. Well, I'll... Thank you. And he said, uh, typical uh, Brit, who, who's been a great guy, but he said, brilliant. <laughs> and he said, uh, what kind of a car do you want? I said, well, like his Roadster. Uh, he said, uh, yeah, I said, like the Roadster. He said, yeah, the, that engine, that was the small block engine at that time. I said, yeah, just like the Roadster. He said, uh, engine up front? And I said, yeah, just like the Roadster. Nobody <laughs> told me it hadn't been done for 30-some years. <laughs> <laughs> but he told me I was brilliant. Here, I could get that. Uh, he told me I was brilliant, and uh, everything I did, agreed to do that he suggested, I was brilliant. So, <laughs> but uh, to tell you the truth, he built a great car for us in a GTR one. He designed it. He built it. Uh, he was on budget. Everything he represented to us was perfect, and uh, he did a great job. So I have to give my hats off to him. So, so for you, part of the racing, it sounds like it provides credibility for the other cars. So when you're talking about the plans for the GT and saying you want to race it, but it could be a family car too. So yeah. is, is that how you see racing as sort of a crucible that you, you put it through <clears throat> and then you're able to say, look, if it was able to do that, it'll certainly take the groceries home. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, uh, I would say that's half. Uh, I hear the racing people always talking about from the racetrack from the raceway to the roadway. Yeah, that's half. If you looked at the pictures of the field a year ago at Daytona, when they line up all the prototypes, there's only one prototype there. They all, the rest of them, look alike. Uh, they talk about, in racing, there's, you know, racing's funny. And uh, when they talk about uh, uh, making it cheaper to race, or they talk about slowing the cars down, it never happens. It always becomes more expensive, and the cars always go faster. So, you know, that's a myth. Uh, we're going to slow them down, and we're going to, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're going to, it's going to be less expensive to race. That never happens. Uh, to me, racing is a way to prove something new. Like with uh, our Esperantes and our cars, we, we were the light cars. We were the aluminum cars. They weren't going to rust, and they were very safe. And uh, that made your cars, if you could take that weight out, it made your cars performance-wise better. As my son explained to me, it makes it better. So I like that concept of going to the next step. And with the Delta Wing, we really, and with cumulative technologies, keep finding a way to increase. Uh, to me, that is, uh, that's the holy grail. That's, that's what I want to do, because it's a challenge. When I first heard of Panos, 
it was, if, if I've got this right, and maybe you, you can fill in the details, Ford Motor Company had done a very innovative concept car called the Contour, mm -hmm. whose structure was made up of aluminum extrusions, mm -hmm. sort of snapped into these uh, cast aluminum nodes. Exactly. They, they had what they called the T-Drive, very interesting uh, uh, arrangement. But my understanding is Ford did nothing with it. You know, they, they, they showed this brilliant design, whoosh, and at the end of the auto show circuit, that was the last we saw of it. But my understanding is you guys ran with that technology, or at least the... What year was this? God, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I can't remember if it was late 80s or early 90s. Yeah, well, we, we, were, we were doing it in the early, early 90s. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't... Danny would know, my son would know okay. all that. I don't know that history. Uh -huh. But I do know we used ex ex extruded aluminum, we used the nose, and we were the first to, to be a customer of Superform for the body oh, panels. I remember that. We were the first yes. customer of Superform. Hmm. And, uh, you know, all this has gone, again, uh, success is, I, you know, people say, I like this, people say, you know, you can die from a thousand paper cuts. That's true. But if you give me enough thousand sheets of paper, I can also climb a mountain and look over to the future. And I think what we were talking about before in the industry and racing and with the companies, you get inside the fence, and maybe that guy inside the fence with those nodules and that extruded aluminum uh, was about to find the door out. <laughs> I don't know. But, yeah. but we know that... They, that there's a fence, and sometimes you can escape, and sometimes you can't. Don, I'm intrigued by you because you invented the cigarette patch, yeah. right? So for people who don't want to smoke, and it's hard to kick the nicotine habit, they can wear the patch. You made a bunch of money on that. Uh, to go from that to where you're so heavily involved in automotive right now, I, I, I know you, you talked about part of it uh, with your son, you know, per Gary's question there. But, you know, it's one thing to, to say, yeah, I'll dabble in this. But you've done more than dabble. I mean, you, you've, you've plunged headfirst into doing uh, uh, generations of race cars. You, you bought the whole, uh, you know, uh, racing circuit, the Le Mans, uh, Petit Le Mans circuit here. Uh, you continue to do this. So, I mean, obviously, you got the bug. I mean, what, what's driving you to stay in this? The challenge, because it's new. I mean, uh, uh, at my age, I'm not going to sit around and do something everybody else is doing. I want to do something that is different. And uh, uh, I'm doing a book in the future. Uh, but Tell the uh, title, because I know what the title is, and it's a great title. Drinking, Driving, and Drugs. <laughs> <laughs> drugs from the patch. Uh, yeah. And the, the, the time release, I understand, that's the real core technology, yeah. right? Yeah. Drinking because you've got wine Drink. now. You've got a winery. You make how many bottles do Half you do a, a year? Bottles. Half a million Half bottles a, million. a year. Wow. And the driving we've been talking about. Yeah. And You're having fun. Pharmaceuticals, yeah. <laughs> Drinking, driving, and drugs. Yeah. Well, th so that's a great title. Don't do, do the book, but keep yeah. that title. Don't take this wrong. It reminds me of Elon Musk, who started with PayPal, and now he's got SpaceX and Tesla. So, um, you know, maybe... Maybe you ought to uh, affect a South African accent and sell some stock. E e Eli has nothing to worry about. I, <laughs> I'm uh, several generations different from him. Uh, I'm pleased and happy that I'm 81 years old today. And in fact, I've got more energy about this than I, when I look back. I had four or five years ago. But uh, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, retire. Uh, I like to do things that are different, uh, even building a research pharmaceutical group in Ireland and in, in, uh, started in late 1969 into the 70s when it was emerging as a third world country. Mylan Laboratories I founded in West Virginia. It's the largest generic company in the world. I founded a West Virginia pharmaceutical company in 1960 in a condemned roller skating rink in White Sulphur Springs. Wow. Which is where you're from, right? White Sulphur My Springs? wife is from Lewisburg. Which, uh -huh. is, right which is just right up the road. Yeah, I right. went to Greenbrier Military Academy. Wow. But I was raised in a little town called Spencer, which you know where Speed is, right? You, you oh, yeah. Speed or yeah. Yeah. Walton? Yep. Well, Spencer's 50 miles from them. That's 50 miles from nowhere. 
<laughs> <laughs> How many employees do you have at uh, Pano's Automotive? And, up, and the Delta Wing Technology Group, we have about 160 employees. Man, you do a lot with that amount of people. Yeah. And, and you're all, that's private, right? You know, that's all yeah, privately that's private, held? Yeah, that's not, uh, yet, it's, it's still private, but. See, that's what I mean, you could sell stock I'm, and, I'm, well, I'm, you know, I'm Tesla's public. worth $250 a share, they're yeah. 260 these I days. I built, uh, Elon Corporation Ireland was the first Irish company to ever be publicly traded in the United States, so uh -huh. I did that. Milan Labs I did, mm -hmm. another company, Gen CSC Core, I was chairman of. I've been down that route. Uh, but uh, I like the challenge. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not just that it's motor racing. It is mm -hmm. what is the challenge? What can you do to make a difference? And also, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you need to leave it better than what you found it. You need to make some progress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so over your years and your time in racing, you've undoubtedly met all kinds of colorful characters. Can you, can you share with us some of the people that you've met in your career that, that you, you really find to be fascinating? Oh, uh, one of the guys that uh, I, res uh, I, I have a great respect for is Dr. Ulrich of Aldi. He's done a great job. Who runs their race team. Yeah, and uh, starting out, we were, we were racing pretty competitively, and uh, we could beat them. Uh, I had a lot of respect for him. Uh, uh, Alan Springer from Porsche. Uh, who's retired, and I have a lot of respect for him. My, mine would be more on the sports car side. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of respect for him. Uh, uh, there's a, a young guy coming up in the ranks in Porsche called Wallacer. I think he's, the, he's a coming star. Uh, on, the, uh, on the racing or the administrative side, uh, uh, I was lucky to uh, get the services of Scott Atherton to to lead the building of the American Le Mans series. Uh, Mario Andretti, I was delighted to have him drive our car at Le Mans, uh, which... Uh, That's quite a get. Yeah, he started me smoking again. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the guy who invented the patch is now smoking again. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how did that happen? How did Mario cause you to start smoking? Uh, it was about four in the morning at Indianapolis, and we're in the garages, and you know, at Le Mans, it's seven mile track. And uh, got to headphones. At the Indianapolis Curve, you're saying? The Indianapolis Curve, right, yeah. at Le Mans. Right. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, car, I forget what number, car so-and-so, which was Andretti, off at Indianapolis and uh, hit the tire, tire barriers. And that's about 140 mile an hour corner. And uh, the radios went dead. And I thought, oh, my God, I just killed one of the great, race car drivers of all time and a guy was walking by lighting a cigarette and I just reached over and took it. <laughs> <laughs> and that could have only happened in France these days, yeah. by the yeah. way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, that was in 2000. So that and then was... after Mario was okay, you still... <laughs> yeah. He got back. Uh, he was driving with Brabham and, yeah, and Magnuson. He got back. He was... He was a little sore. He had taken a big hit, but they got the car back out. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, he's a hell of a he is a hell of a guy and a hell of a, a hell of a nice guy. I mean, he, he he's the perfect spokesman for the Indy Racing Series yeah, right yeah. now, and and for racing in general. But that he is, is and and the other the other one which I got to know, actually knew him before I got into racing was Paul Newman. Hmm. Uh, he had come to Ireland and he built one of his ranches villages there for kids. And my wife and I built one of the houses for uh, the children. And I got to know him from that. And then when he, uh, I, don't know, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but he became aware we were going to build this GTR1 car. And actually, when we got it in, he was, he was the guy that tested it first at Road Atlanta. No kidding. And then he drove for us at uh, uh, Lime Rock with Doc Mundy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, race car drivers, uh, if I could have three, uh, it would be Alan McNish, J.J. Leto, David Bravo. No kidding. Alan McNish, because if he's a lap down and it's coming into the, the race, he's going to win. <laughs> 
J.J. <laughs> Leto is the best traffic driver that's out there. He can get his way through traffic like I'm, nobody I've ever seen. And David Brabham, because he has 90% of all those qualities, but he's cerebral and he knows how to set up a car. Hmm. So that would be my pick for LeMond's driver's team. Only one of those was my driver, by the way, but mm-hmm. the, the others drove for other people. But right. That would be the three that I would vote. Your dream team. Yeah, dream team. Are you going back to Le Mans with your car this year? Uh, no, we won't be going with a car. I, I will be at Le Mans. I'm a Spirit of Le Mans winner, and uh, I, I participate in that over there every year. Uh, I'm taking my wife, and uh, our daughter and her husband, and her son and his wife. Uh, this was the great epiphany of life. I woke up last year when I was 80 and and realized that all of my children are grandparents. That's a big thought. <laughs> and so we're taking them to Le Mans this year. So, so you're going you're gonna to imbue a new generation with the bug. Exactly, exactly. Well, are, do, do you have any dreams of returning to Le Mans oh, with yeah, the with Delta Wing GT? Or? Yeah. With the Delta Wing GT. And, and, how, and can you talk a little bit about the timing on that? I know he... Discussed that a little bit before, but yeah, I'd like to do it. I'd like to try and get it there next year because we'll do it with the petrol version first because we can do small volume approval. I mean, we're not going to make twenty thousand cars off the bat. Come on, you know. So you can get a small volume approval with an approval and and in, 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 uh, the EU. EU, why can't we apply? That's what what we'll do. Uh, and then after that, I want to race the electric GT. And that, what I said, is the Holy Grail. What are your dreams? Race it at Le Mans, you mean? The Holy Grail at Le Mans is to race a, an electric car and and be able to race as long as a Ferrari and a Porsche can on a tank of fuel. Wow. And to change the batteries as quick as they can fuel and compete with them. I so love so it. compete just as a car, not as an electric car. Yeah, in other I words, want the electric car to compete with their just, just, and and that, and that last and that last uh, uh, item uh, compete with uh, means do you, do you, do you, do, you, do you hope what are your hopes for uh, actually getting the car in in a uh, series to compete head to head because it's been uh, so far raced as a uh, demonstration yeah. model, right? Well. As we, as we all know, there's a lot of different series out there. You can pick your different races. You can go to the Nürburgring, or you can do different ones. Ideally, you'd like to race in a in a series, uh, and then you can get points and championships and all that. But you can still race in other events and gain it. So uh, devoid of the politics, I would like to race in a series. But... Uh, as we all know, whether it's presidential politics today or racing politics tomorrow, uh, there's always politics. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> you know, Gary asked you before how you, you track down this electric motor. I'm intrigued. The more and more you talk, you're, you're all about this disruptive accumul- cumulative, ag- technology. cumulative technology. Yeah. Okay, so you gave us a little bit of the story. Your PR guy, Ed Triolo, goes down and sees this engine. Yeah. What about all the other stuff? I mean, how do you keep track of what might be out there? How do you know this is the one to bet on? Uh, I got a great personal assistant. Her name is Sherry. And uh, she organizes me every morning. God bless her. (laughs) But, uh, you know, we're talking about a battery. And the people that developed that battery at Georgia Tech, uh, Rhett Mayer and his group, DHX Motors, they do work on the motor. I don't work on No, no, no. But how do you find out about all this stuff? I, you seem to be somebody who says, uh, you said it yourself, I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. Yeah. I want to bring something new to the party here. You know, you're never going to go win if you're trying to do what everybody else is doing. you got to do something different. Yeah. But I'm trying to figure out, is it just serendipity you trip over these technologies? Or, or is there a, a plan to go out? Or how does it happen? Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. I don't know quite how to explain it, but I think I think in our lives uh, uh, we all things are always passing us by or through our fingers or come on our radar screen. And uh, basic instinct is I like it, I don't like it, or that's good, or that's bad. 
I'll never watch that show again or whatever. And, uh, uh, and I think I told you in the beginning when I first heard about the Delta Wing, I, I, when I first saw it, I thought kind of the same as everybody else. But then it, it came on the radar screen again, and I paid attention. And I think that, uh, to me, I, I just like things that are different. And uh, uh, that's what I kind of look for. Well, you must have among your employees, among that 160 or so, including engineers and, and designers and so on, uh, people who obviously they're not working at Ford, they're not working at GM, they're not working at yeah. Toyota, whatever. So they're looking for a lot of that too, right? Right. Uh, well, the, the chap that did the design out of Multimatic on the new Ford Mustang, he works for me. He worked for me The Ford GT. He, the Ford GT. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, he worked for you? Yeah, before he went to Multimatic, and now he's ah. back working for me again. <laughs> uh, I have a chap that's CIO, came out of Oak Ridge Laboratories. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, engineers been with us for all through the period of the Panos growth. You know, Panos seems like an, a, a new name, but, uh, you know, it's, it's 25 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't believe that. You know, it just seems like it was yesterday. It does. Uh, and... Uh, we have composite people. We have all that stuff. We've we've been we've been doing that since you were there. I think we were doing composites mm-hmm, then. Mm-hmm. So and that was two thousand or maybe nineteen ninety six. Yeah, when we, I were, first we were visited, starting to yeah. do that. And what what I did was I decided Elon came about. Motor Elon Motorsports and Elon Motors came about because I got p- tired of having to go to England for everything I wanted in racing, and uh, for having motors that didn't work. And I was having motors built by people that built really good motors, but they only raced in two-hour races, NASCAR races, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Mons is 24 hours. So I decided we'll build in our own engine department. We'll build our own carbon fiber facility. And bingo, <laughs> things start happening. Well, then you mentioned earlier in passing that you started using the Superform technology. And as I remember, that's an aerospace process that yeah. allows you to form large... Yeah. sheets yeah. of yes, material. Can, yeah. I mean, we were the to first. John's point, I mean, how the hell did you find out about my son, that? My son found out about that and, 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 and got him in. Uh, and the, chap that, uh, the chap that was head of it then just retired last week. I'm trying to remember his name, but he that was doing it then. We, uh, you, I guess if you march around the forest long enough, you'll finally get poison ivy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. You know, probably a good place to, to wrap this conversation yeah. up, too. Hey, anyway, I want to tell you oh, one Tell us story. one more. You bet. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you about the Lawns win. Uh, Esperante GT. This is what year? 2006. We'd won Sebring with uh, Newman House team and Multimatic, uh, Sebastian Bourdais. We won Sebring. And there was a team in England, LNT, Lawrence Thomason, who came to us, who'd raced uh, other cars at, uh, uh, at Le Mans and said he wanted to race in Esperante in January uh, of 2006. Bought the car uh, and uh, went to Le Mans. Uh, we had a big chat about strategy and all that stuff. Nice, and we were supportive of his racing our car. And uh, he won. And uh, so that won Panos uh, with him, a gentleman driver, seven seconds off of Tom Kimber Smith uh, and four seconds off the next driver in the car. Not only did they win, but they set the record for most distance traveled, okay, as a GT up, up at that time. And uh, it was so great that he, uh, uh, he called and said, let's go th- up to the podium. You know, he was all excited. And I said, no. You guys, a privateer team beating the factory Porsches, factory Ferraris, the Aston Martins. You guys go up there, you get, and it's all your glory. And uh, he, by then, had become a very good friend. And uh, I said, I'm going back to the car. I'm going back the, to the chateau. And uh, I'm walking out back to where the uh, team owners could park their cars. And down the hill comes this big German guy. I mean, he was like a house. He had a hat on, a Porsche. He had Porsche on his arms, Porsche on his chest. And he came down and he saw me. Well, 
as you can see, I've got ginger hair, so I can't hide very well anywhere. <laughs> and he says, are you Don Panos? And I said, yes. And he says, it's a good thing Patrick Long had a problem in that Porsche, or you would never have won that race. <laughs> and I looked at him, and he was big. And I looked up, and I said, what about the other 13 Porsches? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> and then I beat a hasty retreat. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, Don Panos, thanks so much. This is a dream come true for me to have you on Out of Line Thank After you. Hours. Thank it's you. fantastic. I love what you're doing. Keep it up. I know you will anyway. Yeah, we're going to keep going. That's excellent. And, and come uh, to the show down to stop by the show. You'll see the motor. Cool. You'll see bicep. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. Todd Lassa, thanks so much for stopping in for today's show as well. Uh, thanks for having me, John. And Gary, we'll, we'll keep on doing this. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Appreciate Todd. it. Thank you. Great. Good deal. You bet. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.